Hey guys, just to let you know, this lesson is in collaboration with Flip Academy, a free online platform for all of your GCSE, A-level, IB and CBSE revision out now on web at www.flip.academy and also as an app for Apple, iOS and Android. It really is better than all the other GCSE platforms out there. It covers all the topics in great depth and has an app that you can download your courses on and use offline. Hello everyone and welcome to Flip Academy. Today we're going to be looking at the geometry uh, topic from the AQA spec. So first things first is we have a the first spec point goes to a bunch of terms and definitions you need to be able to use and also define. So for example, first you need to know what the term points means. So again, points is just a point on a 2D diagram, so a 2D coordinate. So if you get a set of axes, you should be able to tell me what a point means. Again, they don't tend to ask for the actual definitions, but you need to be able to use them when you're explaining stuff. Uh, the next thing is a line. That should be fairly uh, self-explanatory. You have vertices. Vertices are, in layman's terms, corners. Okay, so if you have a cube, for instance, right, so let's draw a nice little cube here. The vertices are here, 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 and here. Okay, so it's just where two lines or two or more lines meet. The next one is a plane. So a plane might be one that you're not too sure about, but essentially it's just a 2D slice of an object. So for example, if I just draw like an X and Y axis like this, this is a plane because it only has two dimensions, right? X, so left and right, and Y up and down. So again, if I were to take this cube again as an example, if I took a slice through the middle of it, that now becomes two-dimensional, it becomes a plane. Okay. The next one we have is parallel lines, uh, should be hopefully self-explanatory. So parallel lines, two lines or more, so two or more lines that never get closer together or further apart. further apart. Okay, So that's a really key thing. Okay, It's not just two lines who don't touch, it's two lines that will never touch because they never get further away or closer together. So, the next couple of definitions that we have, we also have perpendicular lines, so it's kind of the opposite to parallel lines. So perpendicular lines are just two or more lines that meet at right angles. And again, a right angle is just 90 degrees. Okay, so in general, they may ask you to prove that a line is perpendicular or, so again, with a lot of the diagrams, they don't draw them to scale. But if they draw this little box, that means it's a right angle, which means these two lines are perpendicular to each other. But you do have to wait for that. Okay, or you have to prove it. Uh, next thing, right angles. So we just went through what a right angle is. You also need to know a polygon. Just an n-sided shape. Okay, so all shapes are going to be polygons. Okay, all two D shapes, and then you have something called a regular polygon. So here's a bit of a specialist. Okay. All regular polygons are polygons, so they're n-sided shapes. However, all angles are the same, and all sides are the same. Okay, so all sides are the same length. All angles are the same length. We give you a regular polygon. Okay, so if you have a regular pentagon, all five of those sides are equal in length, and all five of the interior angles are equal in size. And you should also be able to draw a diagram from a written description. So basically if they say, oh, we have a triangle that has size 3 and 4 and 5 centimetres, you should be able to draw that diagram. Okay, it doesn't have to be accurate or anything, it just needs to be drawn. The next topic is construction. So construction is fairly a kind of uh, tricky sometimes, but honestly it's just a few simple rules. Construction refers to the use of a compass 
and a ruler. So the ruler part, some students forget. Um, and you also, what you need to be able to draw is you need to be able to draw perpendicular bisectors. And again, you can find videos on how to do this fairly easily on our website. So perpendicular bisectors, this is where uh, they meet at 90 degrees and it cuts in half. So it cuts the line in half, okay? So you're going to have a straight line and the perpendicular bisector will be another straight line that meets at 90 degrees and cuts it directly in half. Okay, so you should be able to do that. And you should also be able to kind of uh, solve loci problems as a result of that. So, <clears throat> next we get a bit more interesting. We have properties of angles. Angles on a point, angles on a straight line. Okay, so angles on a straight line. Add to 180 degrees. Okay, so in this case we have x plus 121 should equal 180. Okay, so then x must therefore be 59 degrees. Okay, so you need to be able to not only know the properties but also be able to use the properties in questions. Okay, and again the next one is angles around a point. So angles around a point. They don't equal 180 degrees, it's basically two lots of that, it's 360 degrees. So in this question here we have that right angle which is 90 degrees, plus the 145 degrees, plus x should give me 360. 90 plus 145 is not 1, it's 235 degrees, plus x equals 360, so then x is just equal to 360 minus 235. So again, you should be able to not only uh, know the properties, but be able to use them to work out the answers to certain problems. Okay? So, hopefully that's all okay thus far. The next thing we have are the rules of parallel lines. Okay? So sometimes people call them Z, F and C angles. So, but beware, you're not allowed to call them that in an exam. So if we have two parallel lines, Okay? And you're just going to have to take my word that they're parallel. They will have this arrow on them. If two lines have an arrowhead on them, it means that they are parallel to one another. Okay. Now, if I were to join these two lines using another line, that's not parallel at all. However, we can say a few different things. So, for example, this angle here and this angle here are equal to each other. And this is called alternate angles. Alternate angles are equal to each other. And again, the key point here is that you have to have two parallel lines. Now, the reason why it's sometimes called a Z angle is if I follow this cursor along here, can you see it looks like a giant Z? Okay. You also need to be able to use this for corresponding angles as well. So if we have what's so-called F angles, okay? So we have two parallel lines here, and then we have another line. Again, the line can kind of go in any direction. Can you see this looks kind of like an F? Well, these angles here are also equal, and that's called corresponding angles. So again, if we call them X and Y, so this would be X is just equal to Y, are equal. Now, using these two facts, you can actually work out what the next um, angle rule that we have is. And if we have two kind of things here, this looks remarkably like an F angle. However, we're not looking at the underside, we're actually looking at these two angles here. Okay? Now you'll actually see, uh, and this will be an interesting proof for you to try on your own, again it's not tested on the spec or anything, but if you are interested, using corresponding angles, you can actually work out why co-interior angles works. And what this is called, and I already gave away the name, this is called a C angle or a co-interior angle. They add to 180 degrees. Okay, so in other words, X plus Y is equal to 180 degrees. 
You do technically have one more. So if you have two uh, lines like this, and you have an angle on either side, but they're made from the same two lines, X and Y, that's called vertically opposite. So vertically opposite, which can be a bit misleading because technically these two, let's call them W and Z, are also equal to each other. So even though it's called vertically opposite, it's not always going to be vertical. It can also be the left and right ones are equal. So in other words, we have X is equal to Y and W equals Z. And to be honest, these rules aren't too bad to remember if you just do a ton of practice. So we have a ton of practice right here. Okay. So A, B and C D are parallel lines. And again, you can see the big arrowhead I was talking about. Okay. But it also tells me in the question that they're parallel. So you either need to look for the arrowheads or read the question. Okay. And if the question says that they're parallel, but it doesn't have the arrowheads, draw the arrowheads on. And we have to work out what the size of angle X is, which is this angle here. So if I have a look, these two angles are on opposite sides and they're made from the same two lines, which means that must be 53 degrees. And this is what these questions nine times out of 10 will ask you. You have to give a reason for your answer. Or if it's like a three format question, they'll say, give a reason for each step of your working out. You can't just write random numbers like guessing if it's 53 degrees. Now, the reason cannot be F, Z, or C angles. You have to write the actual proper name. So in this case, it's just vertically opposite angles. Are equal. And that's it. And again, these aren't technically vertical, but they're still opposite angles on the opposite sides of the lines. Then part C says, write down the size of the angle Y. Well, if I have a look at Y, if I trace over this, that to me looks like a big Z. Okay. Now again, if you remember what I said about Z angles, they are equal to each other. So that is also 53 degrees. Okay. Now here's where things can get a bit funky is the reasoning cannot be Z angles. You will not get the mark. Okay. So you need to say specifically that alternate angles are equal. Now I will say that doing a lot of these questions one after another, it can get very tiring writing out the reasons. So, you know, some students do complain about this. I would recommend just doing a couple of questions a day, but you know, spreading it out, right? Like if you're going to do a hundred questions, do maybe three or four a day instead of doing all of them at once. Otherwise you're going to start writing shorthand or not writing the full word out. So for example, some people just write Z angles, F angles, but then in the actual exam, they forget if it's alternate corresponding or co-interior. To avoid that, spread it out and just write the whole thing out. Okay. I know it's a bit boring, but you only normally have to do one in the exam. So it shouldn't take you, shouldn't be too bad. Okay. Here's another type of question that they can ask you. So we have all of these angles labeled and it says, a, B, and C, D are parallel again, and we have the arrowheads. Angle of 110 is shown on the diagram. Write down the letter of one other angle, size 110. Now, the interesting thing here is that there are multiple answers. Okay? So I'm going to show you all of them. Okay? First things first, we have a vertically opposite angle, so we can write B. And the reason for that one would be vertically opposite angles. Okay? angles are equal. So we actually do have a few more. I'm not going to write them all out, but I will talk through them. The next one is this looks like a big Z. It's a really weird looking Z, but it looks like a Z. So D is also 110 degrees. And again, it's not Z angles. It's because alternate angles are equal. We also have an F angle, which is angle F. Okay. And again, it's not F angles. It's corresponding angles are equal. The next one we have is, and that would be pretty much it for all of them. Um, that would be all the ones I can think of. Okay, so you can pick any one of them and you'll get the full answer. And again, look, you get two marks for just the answer. Not bad. The next part is you need to apply the special uh, properties of special quadrilaterals and triangles. So again, you need to keep in mind this is not just um, 
areas or anything like that. It's also to do with angles and also to do with their lengths. So let's look at all of the different um, special quadrilaterals and triangles we have. So the first one, if we do the quadrilaterals first, we have the square. And you might think, well, that's not really a special quadrilateral, but it actually is. And what's special about it is all sides are the same length. All sides, same length. That is the special property. So remember, you need to apply this. So what they might do is give you just one side and say it's two centimeters, they say find the area. You need to know that all sides are the same, so two times two. The next one you have is the rectangle. And again, you might think that doesn't sound very special. But once again, you would be slightly mistaken. The difference is that the opposite sides are the same length. Op sides, same length. So I'm writing slightly like a caveman, but hopefully you get my point. So opposite sides are the same length, and uh, the adjacent ones are different, right? So you have two pairs of equal lengths. Now we get into ones that you might actually believe are uh, slightly different. And at the moment, by the way, there's nothing special about the angles, right? They're just all 90 degrees. Parallelograms get a bit more interesting. So we have something that looks like, oh God, that's horrible, sorry. It looks like a square that's been slightly pushed over. But the key points here are that the opposite sides are parallel, okay? So again, op sides parallel. And now, because they're parallel, we can again apply F angles and um, Z and Z angles to this, okay? And sorry, C angles is what I mean. F angles and C angles we can apply to this, okay? So this is where it gets a bit funky, okay? Opposite angles are equal. So if I were to label these A, so let's draw. We have B, C. And these are, by the way, these uh, rules with the parallelograms are ones that everyone always forgets, so please pay attention. So A is the same as C, and B will be the same as D. Corresponding angles, or co-interior, depending on how you want to call them, or adjacent. So adjacent angles add to 180, and you should see that this makes a lot of sense, actually. Okay, so A plus B equals 180, B plus C equals 180, C plus D equals 180, and D plus A is 180. And again, that there, some students will say, oh, actually, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't add up. It does, completely. Like, the opposite angle is going to be equal. So A plus D, whatever, it will make 180, so the opposite sides will still be equal to each other. So that is completely fine. The next one we have is the trapezium. Trapeziums, or trapezoids, which is the plural of trapezium. Right, the top and bottom side are parallel to each other, and it's pretty much it. So the top and bottom side are different lengths. Instead of saying that, actually, I'm going to say two sides are parallel and have different lengths. That's the key point here. Okay, so they do have a slightly strange um, formula for working out the area in that case. And the last one that we're going to do is a kite. So a kite, which has these two kind of short sides, and then it has the long sides here. Yeah, that's a kite. Um, it has a line of symmetry down the middle, okay? Which means these two angles here, again, if we call them, let's call them X and Y this time, is are the same. Because it has one line of symmetry acting straight down the middle. Okay, which actually turns it into two triangles, which you can then use to do geometry with. And that's what they mean by apply the properties. If you ever get a kite, so what you're going to be doing is using triangles to illustrate your points. Speaking of triangles, let's go on to the triangles that you need to know. So, 
the first triangle is going to be an equilateral triangle. Oops. So this is nice and uh, simple. It's actually a regular triangle. All sides and all angles equal. So all of the angles are 60 degrees because 180 divided by 3. And all of the sides are also equal. And realistically, the only other one you need to know, which is the isosceles triangle, is that you have the base angles, so x equals y, okay, which are the so-called base angles, which means it has a line of symmetry going straight down the middle, which means you can cut it in half and turn it into two right angle triangles, which means you can use trigonometry to work some stuff out. Whew. Well, that was um, interesting. So now we're going to move on to yet more stuff that you need to remember, which is the congruence criteria for triangles. First things first, the word congruence just means that they are the same. So they like to give you two triangles and say, are they the same? Are they congruent or are they not? So you have three, well, not three actually, you have four separate congruence triangles and they get given lovely little acronyms. So you have these and RHS. So this SSS means three sides equal length. So if you have a triangle where you can show that all three sides are the same length, that means you have an equilateral triangle, which means all three angles are the same, which means you have a congruent triangle, right? So if three of the sides are the same on each one, that means all three sides are the same. The angles must also be the same, which means you must have the same triangle. I said equilateral slightly earlier. It doesn't have to be equilateral. Okay. SAS, you have two sides. So the S and the S, and the angle between them. So again, if two sides are the same on both triangles, and the angle between them is the same on both triangles, they are the exact same triangle. ASA, if you have two angles and the shared side, And again, if they are the same on both triangles, then you have the exact same triangle, congruent triangle. Lastly, if you have a right angle in both, the same hypotenuse and one other same side, you also have an identical or congruent triangle. Okay, so again, keep in mind that you are comparing two triangles. So if you have three sides on one triangle, three sides of the other, and they're all the same, then it's congruent. If you have two sides on both triangles that are the same and, and the same angle between them, then they're the same. If you have two angles, so maybe they're the base angles, and the side between them is equal, then you have the same triangle. And lastly, if you have a right angle triangle where the hypotenuse on one other side is the same, then because of Pythagoras' theorem, you have the exact same uh, triangle. So here's a good example. So we get given a parallelogram and again using our little notes from before we should be able to say some stuff about them. So for example angle A is the same as angle D and angle C is the same as angle B and A plus C is 180 and so on. Okay. And it says prove that triangle A, B, C so if we draw a relatively straight line between them, is congruent to triangle BCD. So let's have a think, right? Because these sides are parallel and these sides are parallel, and again, if you use two arrowheads, it's to distinguish which ones are which. Well, the side AC is equal to side BD. And, lo and next, the side AB is equal to the side CD, right? 
So these two angle, uh, sides are the same, these two sides are the same. Now what's interesting is the side CB is shared between them, so it has to be the same. So, because of SSS, they are congruent. That's it. Okay. Now, some other things that you can say is you can also point out that angle A, so what you do is you'd say angle, uh, let's call it CAB equals angle. So in a mark scheme, you'll see that there's a bunch of different ways to do it, which might confuse you. So I'm just going to show you it in that regard as well. We also have, right, that these two angles are the same and the sides that make them up are the same, right? So we also have that CA equals uh, DB and AB equals CD. So because of SAS, right, side, angle, side, and the opposite, you know, the corresponding sides are the same, they are congruent. And you can keep going on. You can even say that the angles um, ACD and uh, DBA are the same. Therefore, we have angle side angle, which again is congruent. So there are multiple different ways. So when you look at a mark scheme, please don't get confused um, or try not to get confused. I shouldn't just say don't get confused. It's just because there are multiple ways to do it. So in a mark scheme, they might tell you that 10 different things are the same. Therefore, any congruent any reasonable congruency criteria is accepted. So just be uh, a bit careful of that, okay? Try and map it out yourself and you'll be able to see what, what they're talking about, basically. Okay, the diagram shows two triangles, ABD, yeah, and BCD. Prove that triangle ABD is congruent to BCD. Okay, cool. Well, interesting, we have the same angle here and here, right? So I'm just gonna immediately write angle BDC equals angle ABD. So it'd be really convenient if we can prove that this missing angle for each of them is um, the same, right? For two reasons, right? If all three angles are the same, um, that doesn't prove anything. But if we have two angles on the side between them, because it's shared, so uh, side DB is shared, so it must be the same. So we're going to be looking at angle side angle. So this angle here and this angle here. Well, if you notice, we're probably going to get the same thing. So, uh, actually, you know what? We just need this one. So let's work out what this one is. Well, it'd be 180 minus 75 minus 42. So 180 minus 75, that's 105 minus 42. That is 63. Interesting. So angle ADB. equals angle DBC. Give me a second there. So ASA, they are congruent. So if you're wondering why I didn't work out the angle at C, it's because I didn't need it, right? I specifically knew I was going to do angle side angle because the angles are the same and the side between them that share between them is also the same. Cool. A few examples there. Hopefully that all makes sense. Uh, let's go on to the next one. Use Pythagoras angle facts, triangle congruence to prove results. So the only one we haven't gone through at the moment is Pythagoras. Pythagoras' theorem is simply a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And this has to be for a right angled Triangle, okay? I've seen so many students try and use this on a non-right angle triangle, okay? So it specifically states that if this is A, this is B, this is C, and this is a right angle triangle, then A squared plus B squared equals C squared, where C has to be the hypotenuse. It doesn't actually matter what the other two sides are as in their letters, what you represent. So you need to be able to do this to prove results. So like we did just there, we proved that it's congruent. Let's talk about use that and angle facts and Pythagoras. You may need to use a combination of all of them to do this, okay? So again, it's just something that they've thrown into the spec that they could ask you to do. D 
doesn't come up that, that often to use all of them, but you know. Um, so honestly, it's actually not that bad. If you look over here, we've used angle facts and triangle congruence to prove it. The only thing we didn't have to do is use Pythagoras, okay? So if I went back up to this side, right, if I had two right angle triangles, then they may expect me to use Pythagoras as well. So that's the only new thing that they can add. And that would be, again, to prove that one of the sides is equal to another one. Proofs regarding triangles. So again, proving congruence like we've just done. Um, that's pretty much it that they can ask you for that. So it's pretty much stuff that we've already done. Translate shapes on a coordinate axis. Okay. So uh, translation is something that can be kind of tricky. So if they give you a coordinate axis like this, and they can give you a square, for example, triangle, circle, well, not a circle, actually, anything that has points. Circle will be extremely difficult to do. They can ask you to translate. So the way you can do this is you can translate using, for example, a vector. So they may say, translate by this. So that means you're going two to the right and three up. And then if it was negative numbers, so you might have negative four and negative seven, then that would be four to the left, seven down. Okay, so positive numbers means you're going to the uh, right and up. Negative numbers means you're going left and down. And again, there can be a combination of them, right? So you could have minus two and plus three. So two to the left, three up. So the top number represents right and left. Bottom number represents up and down. So honestly, fairly, fairly self-explanatory, I think. Um, so again, this is specifically translating shapes, not just transforming them. So that can be something slightly different. Describe changes and invariants caused by combinations of transformations. So a question that they might ask you to do is that shape A is translated by uh, 5 and minus 6. It's then reflected. Where does it end up? And all you'd need to do is follow the transformations and show that they end up at the same place or not. That's it, it's a higher only topic, very rarely comes up, but again, they can expect you to do that. So what I'd recommend doing is going back and looking through transformations and making sure you're okay with all of them. So with reflections, just stick a mirror along the line, draw what you see, nice and easy. Rotations, trace over it using paper, and rotate it, nice and easy. Shouldn't be too bad, but you need to practice in order to do it. Identify and apply circle definitions and properties. So circles are a special case because they are a one-sided shape. So you have a nice, perfect circle like that. So the different kinds of definitions that you need to do. Well, the dot here, they can also ask you to label a circle, by the way. So there was a question a while back where, and this is actually in the old spec, but it does, it can still come up, is they give you a circle and they ask you to label all these different lines on it. So the dot in the middle, that is just called the center. Nice and easy, right? The radius is here. So it's half the width, where the width is also called the diameter. So we've just gone through two definitions. Diameter is the full width of the circle. It has to go through the center, okay? Half the width, um, so it's from center, to the circumference. So what's the circumference? Well, the circumference is just the fancy word for the um, perimeter of the circle. Now again, with the diameter and the radius, it has to be from the center. It has to go through the center, okay? so. A line that doesn't go through the center but goes to both edges will not be equal to the diameter. It will be smaller, okay? And if you did have a line like that, where it just goes from circumference to circumference, it's called a chord, okay? So a diameter is the actual width of the circle. It goes through the center. A chord is a line that goes from one edge to another edge, but it never touches the center, okay? And that's what you really need to know. Um, the additional content, however, comes up with some more definitions. And I'm going to draw another circle in order to describe them because uh, my other diagram is getting a bit messy. So let's try and draw a potato. 
So the next one we have is a tangent. A tangent touches the circle at one point only. It doesn't go through the circle, it glances off it. So you can imagine this is like the circle edge, it just goes, just touches it. It doesn't go through it, okay? A few more things we need to know is a segment will be this kind of area. So is a segment. So it's the area made by a chord. So the way I like to think of it is imagine that's like a giant cake and we've sliced off the top of it. The segment is the bit you're removing, okay? You then need to know, so if I draw, that's my center. We have a line going from here to here. This thing here, right, is called an arc, okay? And that is just a fraction of the circumference, okay? Whereas this thing here is called a sector. And I like to think of sectors as like uh, slices from a pizza, right? So for a big pizza, the, a sector is basically one slice of the pizza, right? It goes from the middle to the out and it has an arc, okay? So it looks like a big cone. Well, a 2D cone anyway. Cones are three-dimensional objects. hope this is okay so far. Um, a lot, again, this topic is a lot of memory, so uh, I hope you're able. Higher, you need to use circle theorems, okay? So the circle theorems that we can have are, so there are quite a few different ones that we can have, um, but you also need to be able to actually use these in proper kind of cases. So let's look at some of the ones that we have. You first have the alternate segment theorem. You don't need to know the names. You just need to know what they mean. So ultimate segment theorem. Okay, ultimate segment theorem. So we have a circle, okay? You have a tangent here. And what you do is you have three points. On the circumference. Okay, uh, all it means is that this angle here would be equal to this angle here. Likewise, this angle here is equal to this angle here. Okay, so if you have a tangent and you have um, <clears throat> angles that are created from the tangent, in like a weird Z uh, angle situation, you have those two are equal. Uh, angle at center theorem. Uh, again, this one, I like this one. This one comes up a lot, so really, really pay attention to this one. Okay, You have a circle. Again, I'm getting slightly better at drawing these. We have A, B, and then we're also going to put a point at the centre and call it C. That just seems natural. Okay. Uh, if you have theta here, this would be two theta. Now, th there's a critical, critical point. You need to practice circle theorems because <clears throat> some of these can be a bit difficult to kind of navigate around. If you notice, both of these angles are created from lines from the same point on the circumference. Okay? So, both of your angles, the lines that make them up, have to end on the same points on the circumference for this to work. Also, this angle needs to be at the actual center. If it, if you can't prove it's at the center and it doesn't say it's at the center, you can't assume, okay? But all it means is that angles have tended at the center of a circle are twice that at the circumference. Nice and easy. Here's where things get a bit more interesting. I start testing my art skills. Angles in the same segment theorem. So if you notice, I'm not writing out fully uh, explanations because you don't need to. You just need to be able to say basically what I'm saying, right? 
angles at the circumference are half that at the center. Cool, so again, I can't tell if I'm getting better or not. Uh, no, neither of these points are going to be at the center. However, what we're going to do is if you create an angle from the same two points on the circumference, okay? So can you see that I'm making these out the same? Both of these angles will be identical to each other. So if you take two points on the circumference and create two angles from those points, those have to be equal to each other. Okay? That's a very, very useful one indeed. Again, it comes up a lot more than you might think. Okay? So again, two points of the circumference, we've created two angles, the angle at A and the angle at C, those have to be the same because they're from the same two points. Okay? We're almost halfway. <laughs> Now we're about halfway. The next one, uh, super, super rare, super situational. Angles in a semicircle. Um, this one very, very seldomly comes up. So if you have a circle, and this is the diameter, okay? The other way to show that is if you just say that this is C. And what happens is if you take, if you make an angle, from the ends of the diameter, so it doesn't matter who, where they are, right? They will always be right angles. Okay? So again, if I make, take the diameter, the two edges, and I create an angle anywhere along here, it will always be a right angle. Again, very situational, doesn't come up much, but if it does come up, you're going to be kicking yourself if you didn't learn this. Hope you're ready. There are two more that I want to go through. Um, actually, unfortunately, there are three more. Chord of a circle. So, if we, again, wow, that's probably the worst one so far. If I take a line from the center of a circle to the edge, which is called a radius, and I take a chord, the perpendicular from the center always bisects a chord, right? So this thing here, the chord has been bisected. So it's been cut in two. Um, I'm not gonna lie to you. I've never seen this used yet. So that might be an indicator that it might be used in 2023, okay? Because I've never seen it used. But again, it's technically a circle theorem. It's technically something you need to know. So keep that in mind, okay? They might bring it back. Next one, cyclic qu quadrilateral. This is a super common one. Super, super, super common. And it's also one that people get wrong a lot. So let's go through it. So we need to know what a cyclic qu quadrilateral is. So cyclic quadrilaterals. They are quadrilaterals formed from four points on the circumference of a circle. You have all four points have to 100% be touching the circle. They have to be on the circumference. A lot of the time, well not a lot of the time, but when they want to trick you, which is fairly frequently, they'll only put three points on the edge and they'll put one slightly further in. And people say, oh it's a cyclic quadrilateral. Nope, it's not. It's not a cyclic quadrilateral at all. And instead you're going to be using one of the other circle theorems. Cyclic quadrilaterals have to, have to, have to be on the circumference of the circle, all four points, okay? And it's nice and easy. The opposite angles add to 180, okay? So if we just call them, let's say, A, B, C, D, A plus C equals 180. So as you can probably see, this would be absolutely catastrophic if you get this wrong. So you have A, B, C, D. So again, just to write that out again, those things will add up to 180. Those two. Almost done. <laughs> the next one is actually kind of two in one. It's to do with, it's both rules to do with the tangents of a circle, okay? So first one, uh, let's go through it. 
Ooh, that's not bad. All right, I'm actually quite proud of that. If we have a tangent to a circle, so let's draw the tangent coming from, let's say, here. That was less good. And we have the radius. It will always meet at 90 degrees. Tangents and radius meet at 90 degrees. Tangents and radius meet at 90 degrees, okay? Anytime you have a tangent, the radius from the center of the circle will always be 90 degrees. The next thing that might uh, interest you is that tangents from the same point are the same length as well. And that's it in terms of circle theorems. Uh, you need to be able to use them. They're incredibly uh, common and they're very useful as well. So again, that is for hire only. You need to be able to use the coordinate axes to solve problems. So again, this can be from translating, it can be working out lengths, it can be all sorts of stuff. Um, essentially, you need to be comfortable when they put shapes on a coordinate axis. Hopefully that's not too bad. Now we have even more stuff to remember. So now it's 3D shapes. Identify properties of cubes, cuboids, prisms, cylinders, pyramids, cones, and spheres. Okay, so there's not too much to know. With a lot of these, they actually have to give you the uh, equations for. So cubes, uh, simple properties, right? How many faces does it have? How many vertices does it have? How many sides does it have, right? So faces, again, those are the 2D planes. So there's going to be six faces, right? And all six of them are equal. Whereas with cuboids, they have opposite faces equal, equal only, but they also have six faces. In terms of the vertices, imagine in your head you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you have eight vertices. How many sides? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You can just imagine it in your head and it's perfectly fine. So all those are fine. Prisms is the interesting one. So a prism is just a 2D object, right? So it can be a square, it can be a triangle, it can be a cylinder, right? All of these are prisms. That's like a toboran. Okay? And they all come under the big umbrella of prisms. So to work out, for example, the volume of them, you just need to work out the area of the front face and times it by the length. That's it. Area times length. So if it's a uh, cuboid or square based, uh, a square pyramid, uh, square prism even, then you just work out the surface area, uh, the area of the front piece, which is just a square or a cube, or, uh, sorry, or a rectangle, times by the length. If it's a triangular prism, then you work out the front face triangle times by the length, and so on. A cylinder is just a circular prism. That's it. For the uh, volumes of pyramids and cones, they will give you the equation for it, and spheres, uh, likewise. Uh, well, actually, now with the sphere, they might not. So a sphere, you just need to know that the volume 4 over 3 pi r cubed. And again, this is a sphere, but you can't really... I mean, you can. You can shade it to make it look like a sphere. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and that's pretty much all the properties you need to know for that. Interpret plans and elevations. So plans and elevations. Remember, a plan is a top-down view of a 3D shape. So they give you like a little square grid. An elevation is just kind of the front or side view of a 3D shape. You just need to be able to interpret them. Not too bad. Use standard units of measure. So all you need to do is, we've, we've done units in the previous videos, right? If it's a length, you're going to be using meters, centimeters, and millimeters, right? So therefore, if it's an area, you're going to be using meters squared, centimeters squared, millimeters squared. And if it's a volume, you're going to be using meters cubed, okay? And again, we've done measures in all of the other summary videos that we've done. Again, it should be super, super obvious uh, for mass kilograms, for uh, capacity centimeters cubed, volume centimeters cubed as well. So capacity would be liters as well that you can use, money, time, etc. Been through it a bunch of times. Hopefully it's not too bad. Just stick to the standard units, okay? Measuring stuff in... Um, 
geometric figures. So what they like to do is either give you a scale drawing or they'll draw things accurately. And all you need to be able to do is, using a ruler, you should be able to measure line segments. You, to measure angles, you need to be able to use a protractor, okay? Not really much I can show you on here, but you need to be able to use a protractor properly and a ruler properly, okay? So that would be important. We actually went through this kind of already. You need to be able to uh, calculate areas of triangles, parallelograms, trapeziums, volumes as well. So I went through the volume of prisms and cuboids as well, because a cuboid is just a square prism. So the area of a triangle is just half base times height, right? So if you have like a, a right angled triangle, let's call it, right? That's a nice little triangle, base height. Half base times height. Area of a trapezium. That, if we draw out a little trapezium, not the best, but. Area of a trapezium is simple. It is just half A plus B times H. Okay, so again, these aren't too tricky um, in order to kind of work out. Area of a parallelogram is pretty nice. It's basically the same as one for a square. All you need to do is times the base and the height. And that's it. So if you have a, so you can say that's the base, and you need to work out the height. Uh, I should actually write that down. A times h. Okay. And again, for the volumes of prisms, just go up above. You work out the area of the front face and times it by how long it is. Um, not too shabby, I think. Uh, but keep in mind that since they've told you in the spec that you have to know them, they will not give you them, okay? Under usual circumstances. In terms of other equations that you need to know, you need to know the circumference. So circumference is just 2 pi r, or is just pi d where D is the diameter, and R is the radius. And then circumference, uh, sorry, the area of a circle is just pi R squared. Pi times the radius to the power of two. Nice and easy. Really not too bad. Still going. <laughs> Calculating arc lengths, angles, and areas of sectors. So we kind of, I kind of showed you what a um, arc is and a sector and everything, but I never really said. I told you it's a fraction of the perimeter or a fraction of the area of a circle. So if we draw a little circle out now, okay. Ooh, that's a nice looking circle. Perfect, right? Here we have some angle, right? And I'm going to call the arc length L, which is just the distance between points A and B, right? It's that curved distance. Now L, if you remember, the circumference is just 2 pi r, right? So it's going to still be 2 pi r. But I told you before that it's a fraction of the circumference. So how do we work out that fraction? Well, it's quite easy. All we need to do is we take the angle and divide it by the total angle in a circle. That is literally all you need to do. Okay, so let's say if that angle was 60 degrees, you do 60 over 360 times 2 pi r, because that is what fraction of the circle that thing is. Now, the area of the sector is exactly the same. So we have pi r squared, but again, because we have a fraction, it's just going to be th theta over 360. Nice and easy. Okay, so you don't need to memorize new equations if you know where that comes from. Okay, likewise, they can actually give you the um, arc length and ask you to work out the angles. You should be able to kind of um, rearrange that without too much hassle. I promise you we're getting quite close to the end. Um, with this, you need to be able to kind of prove that two shapes are the same by showing that the sides are the same or the angles are the same. So again, the best way to do this is using the stuff that we've just worked out. So using areas and volumes and rearranging those uh, for whatever side you need. Next we have Pythagoras' theorem and trig ratios. Again, we've gone through Pythagoras' theorem, but we should note that both of these are for right 
angled triangles only, okay? The trig ratios you can use Sokatoa to remember. So the S stands for sine theta, and that's opposite over hypotenuse. The C stands for cos theta, and that's adjacent over hypotenuse. And Toa, the T is tan, and that's opposite over adjacent. So in terms of how we label these sides, let's have a look-see. So if we have a normal right angled triangle like this, and let's say we're using this angle. The opposite to this angle is, shockingly, the opposite side. Opposite the right angle is the hypotenuse. The other side is just called the adjacent. And you should notice it's next to the theta. Not too bad. But we have a practice question from your actual past, um, from an actual past paper, 2021 paper one. Use trigonometry to work out the value of x. So, if we label our sides, x is our opposite side, and this is the hypotenuse, which means this must be the adjacent. So we have the we want the opposite and we have the hypotenuse, so that's called O and H. If we go back up, which one has O and H? Well that is sol. So sine theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. So we have sine of 30 equals opposite x over 10. So times both sides by 10, and we have x is equal to 10 sine 30. So if we drag over our calculator, we can just type that in. We have 10. That is not a 10. Sine 30 degrees. And that gives us 5. Nice and easy. Oops. Whew. Okay. We're getting there, right? <laughs> so, next thing we need to do is, unfortunately, another memory game. Uh, I'm really sorry about this, so again we have to memorise certain values of sine, cos and tan for different angles. So um, this is a bit tricky, uh, there are a few ways to kind of work it out, um, but again what we can do is just kind of brute force it. So if we do like a little table thing, so or we can just do it like this, so sine of 0 is just 0. Sine of 30, it's a half, and sine of 45. And again, um, one way, one good thing to do, by the way, is to simply use your calculator initially to kind of work out what those values are, okay? But I can show you a little bit of a trick to uh, work those out as well. Um, I'm going to show you a trick with this one in a second. Not all of them have tricks. Unfortunately, some people like to remember different triangles to help them. Uh, that personally never helped me, so I just uh, memorized the values. And again, what you can do is just make sure you're going through this. One. So the way I like to remember it is, and again, this can help you. For sine zero, all we're doing is increasing the number with square rooting by one. So if you follow this, so can you see that all I'm doing is counting? I'm going one, two, well, sorry, zero, one, two, three, four. Square root of zero is zero, zero divided by two is zero. Square root of one is one, over two is a half. Square root of two over two is just square root of two over two. Square root of three over two is square root of three over two. Square root of four is two, two over two is one. So you can remember it as like you're counting. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay? That is one way to do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and you also need to know this for cosine as well. Cos of 0 is 1. And let's just keep going. And you may notice something with the, the cos. Um, or again, there are loads of different ways to kind of remember this. It, it, it kind of depends on... Uh, what works for you. Okay, But again, I would recommend entering it into a calculator just once, just so you can kind of get a feel for it. And, uh, a little bit tedious, but again, that's what they want you to do. Uh, 
uh, with cosine the way I kind of prefer to remember it. Um, and again, this might not work for you, but if you write out the sine ones, the cos one just goes backwards, right? So sine starts at zero, ends up at one, cos starts at one, it ends up at zero, and it goes down in the same steps. So you could do the same thing with root four over two, root three over two, and again, you're just basically counting. Um, but again, if that doesn't work for you, uh, root one over two. Okay, so it's kind of like cos and sine start from the opposite ends and they move towards each other. Uh, the one with tan x can be a bit more interesting. I know I keep saying interesting. It's not necessarily interesting. Um, tan 0, nice and easy. Yeah, so with tan, honestly, this is the one that you just kind of have to brute force. Um, at least that's what I did. With the uh, others, I did have that nice little trick where you're just counting with using um, over two. So root zero over two, root one over two, and so forth. Um, so that made memorizing sine and cos really, really easy for me. But for tan, eh. There are certain ways that you can remember it, but it, in my opinion, it's not. The ways I've seen on the internet just don't really help, right? It seems like very arbitrary rules. So in, I would just memorize the tan ones and then use this little trick that I've shown you in order to memorize sine and cos. Okay, I promise you we're right near the end. Uh, however, the next two pieces are actually um, higher tier content only. Sine and cosine rule. Fun, 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 fun. The sine rule is these are both for non right angled triangles, okay? So if you have just a triangle like this, oh, okay? Uh, thing to remember is we use capital letters to denote angles and we use lowercase letters to, de to denote sides. The, and the only rule is that the side has to be opposite its angle. So angle A has to be opposite side A, side B has to be opposite angle B and so on, okay? Sine rule, nice and easy, is just sine A of A equals sine B of B, sine C over C. So if you have a side and its opposite angle and you have one other side, you can work out its angle or vice versa. So if you have the angle, you can work out the side. So if you have a side angle pair and you have one other side or angle, you can always work out its corresponding side slash angle. Uh, you can also flip it over. So you can also use it like this to help with your rearranging if you're looking for a side instead of an angle. So the top one, you can start with if you're looking for an angle and it's super easy to rearrange. Um, you can rearrange either one of them for it, right? It really doesn't matter. Or you can flip it over. Cosine rule is a bit more fun. Cosine rules is this. A squared equals B squared plus C squared minus 2BC cos. So I only use this when I have the two sides and the angle between them, okay? So what A, B, and C are don't matter. All you need to know is you need to have either all three sides or two sides and the angle that is between them. And that is all you need to know for the cosine rule. But you need to be able to work out unknown lengths and angles from both. Cool. So I did get a question for this. So what we're going to do is we need to work out the distance from P to R. So we're looking for this distance here. Okay, we have two sides here and we can work out the missing angle if we wish to. So a few different things that you can do. Um, this here, can you see that these lines are going to be parallel to each other? Corresponding angles add up to 180, so that'd be 100 degrees. So this thing here would be 360 minus 100 minus 155, which should be 105, if my extremely quick math fails me. To work out the opposite side, we're going to use the cosine rule, because we have two sides and the angle between it. And so this would be side A. So A squared is equal to, it doesn't matter which one's B or C, right? Because you're just adding and squaring them. A squared plus B squared minus two, 
Like the actual order of this doesn't make a difference. Cos of 105. And so a squared is equal to uh, whip out our calculators again. So we have uh, 12 squared plus uh, 28 squared minus 2 and 12, 28 cos 105. That's not our answer though. We need to, so it equals 1101 dot dot dot. And a is equal to the square root of this. So that's another thing. Not everyone remembers the square root, and it makes me cry. 33.2 miles. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a four-mark question. I agree that using this kind of corresponding rule is difficult, so you get one mark for that. You get one mark for working out the angle as a result, so basically this uh, part of the working out here. Then you get a mark for substitution and a mark for getting the answer. Okay, so again, this is part of the previous spec point where it says you need to use all of the angle rules together to show something. In this case, it's not just a cosine rule question. It's also using the uh, corresponding angles, right? Co-interior angles and using angles around a point and then using the cosine rule. Okay, there's about a billion things that they can combine it with. We also have a sine rule question. So if I label this angle A and this side A, I can label label this angle B and this B, we're working out X. So I'm going to use the version of the sine rule where the sides are on top, just to make my life a bit easier. But again, if you use the other one, you'll be able to rearrange it and you're completely fine. Okay, I wanna work out the value of X, which is B, so I can rearrange that now. So I have that B is equal to A sine big B over sine A. Do a nice little substitution we have 13 times sine uh, 13 times sine 38 over sine a which is sine 100 let's find out what that gives us 13 sine 38 whoops that's 7 over sine 100 8.13. It says to one decimal place, so 8.1 centimeters. Not too bad. Not too bad, I think. So the next two points are about uh, so area of a triangle. Um, this is quite an interesting one. I did miss something. So the area is just half a b sine c. So the angle has to be between the two sides. Okay, that's all you need to remember. So in this case, the area, because we have two sides and the angle between them, we can use this. So we have a half, 13, 12, sine, 120. So again, remember, two sides, angle between it, you can work out the um, area. If you don't have the angle between the two sides, either work out the angle or work out a new side. And that should be easy peasy lemon squeezy. So uh, let's do this. Instead of a half, I'm just going to write 0 0.5 because it's easier for me to write on a calculator. Thirty nine root three give you answer to one decimal place, so sixty seven point five. So translations as two D vectors, we actually already went through this earlier, but there is a twenty twenty one paper one question. So it translates point from minus minus two to three. So to go from minus two to three, it's gone to the right by plus five. Seven to minus one, it's gone to the left by minus eight. So we're looking for a vector that looks like this, which is this vector here. And this part is only for higher tier pupils. So we get vectors, we need to be able to add them and multiply them, not multiply vectors, but multiply them by a number. So a plus b, this is super easy. Um, you're going to find it very nice. All you do is you add the top numbers together, so 2 plus 1, and you add the bottom numbers, 3 plus 5. So 3 and 8. Then for 2a plus 3b, we're going to do 2 times a, so 2, 3, plus 3, 1, 5. 
What you do here is you times everything inside the bracket, basically the same as using normal brackets. 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 3 is 6, plus 3 times 1 is 3, 3 times 5 is 15, then we add it just like we did in the previous part, we get 7 and 21. Almost forgot how to add there. Lastly, vector proofs. Uh, this is a very huge topic, but um, we're just going to go through one question quickly now. Um, and again, it's higher here only. So, P is on the point AB, such that AP to AB is, so, 1 fourth and 3 fourths. Go back to the ratios video if you want to uh, recap how to change ratios into fractions. But OP is said to be K3A plus B. So what we need to do is work out how to get from O to P. So to go from O to P, I would go from O to A and go from A to P. But I don't know what AP is. But AP is just going to equal a quarter of A to B. Now to go from A to B, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go... Bear in mind, when you use vectors, you have to go along the vectors you have. So to go from A to B, I need to go down from A to O, and then O to B. Now since I'm going against the vector A, that's going to be a negative A. And I'm going with B, so it's plus B. So, in other words, I have O to A, which is A plus a quarter minus A plus B. So we have A minus a quarter A plus a quarter B. So this gives me three quarters A, because one minus a quarter is three quarters, plus a quarter B. And I know that we can write it as 3A plus B. So the only way to do that is to times both of these by four. However, I can't times by four when I factorize. I need to divide by a quarter. So I'm going to take a quarter out, and that will give me 3A plus B. So K is equal to a quarter. And that brings us to the end of the geometry section of your spec. It's probably one of the longer ones, just like uh, algebra was. However, the next two are a bit shorter, so I look forward to seeing you in those.